You never ask for something you don't need. You know, the only time you ask for stuff is when you really need it. Somebody offers you food and you're not hungry. Or there's food being presented. And the guy's saying, whoever needs some water, I'll give him some water. And you're not thirsty. Are you going to ask for it? No. Who is really going to ask for guidance? Really, really, internally, really going to beg for guidance? Who's that going to be? The one who feels the need for it. If I feel like I can make my own decisions, I'm a free person, I'm a smart guy, I'm pretty intelligent, I went to college, I can make my own decisions, I'm not dumb, I don't need a lot to guide every one of my decisions, then you will make salah, but that salah will not be a request for guidance. It'll just be practice. It'll just be something you do without even thinking about what you're doing. Right? Now Allah says, number one, that the Qur'an is guidance. The two most important terms we should know about the Qur'an, most important terms, when it comes to our personal relationship with Qur'an, are two terms. Huda. Huda means what? Guidance. Okay, Qur'an itself is guidance. And the second term, dhikr. In huwa illa dhikrun. Kalla innaha tadhkira. Wa dhikra al-mu'min. Fadhakkir inna fa'at al-dhikra. Wa dhakkir bil-Qur'an man yakhafu wa'id. Dhakkir, dhikr. Remembrance, remembrance, remembrance. The idea being, guidance is something that is fulfilled. You will be misguided unless you are constantly what? Reminded. The mechanism by which we are guided is remembrance. Dhikr, jazakallah khairan. Is dhikr. So, if that's the case, we are to remember Allah, Allah's guidance, which is Qur'an, and we are to remind ourselves of this Qur'an, and we need that guidance every single day. So Allah, in His profound wisdom, gives us this thing called salah. And He calls this salah, He says, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish salah to remember me. Now what's the longest part of salah? What's the longest part of the prayer? Standing, qiyam. What do we do in the qiyam? We begin by the fatiha, which is a, is a request for what? Guidance. And then as a response to that request, what do we recite? We recite Qur'an. We recite the guidance. First you ask for guidance, then you recite something from the guidance. That's what we do. It is our personal therapy with Allah. It is our personal counsel with Allah. Every time we stand in salah. Every time. Every time. And you know when this relationship of pursuing guidance in the prayer, when that's dead, when that's not there, even though you're praying, your prayers have become empty, and nobody can judge that except you. Really, nobody can judge, right? You understand what's being recited, you know the tajweed, you know the makharij, the ghunna was perfect, the qalqala was just right, right? You didn't mess up on any ayat, you remembered all of them, you even corrected the imam on one, you know, you gave him luqba in one place. It was perfect, you stood the right way, you looked in the right place, your ruku was perfect 90 degree angle, everything was perfect, except there was one thing missing. The only thing missing in this prayer was you weren't asking really for guidance. And that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. We need help. The first, the first we need to acknowledge that we need guidance. And we acknowledge that because the Messenger of Allah is begging for guidance every day sallallahu alayhi wa So if we are to emulate him, we beg for guidance too. We beg for guidance also. Second, we acknowledge this Qur'an, it can be understood. It can be understood. But we need to appreciate that it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's not just information. You can learn tafsir and say, what does Qatada radiallahu anhu say? What does Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma say? What does Ibn, Ibn Tafsir ibn Kathir say? What does Al-Qurtubi say? What does Al-Tabari say about this ayah? You can read all of that. But if you forget why you're reading it, why are you reading it? Guidance. Guidance. You need help. You need counsel. To give you, uh, this part of my talk is going to sound a little crazy, so you got to bear with me, okay? The Qur'an has stories. Stories of the Prophets. The story of Adam alayhi salam. The story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Stories. On the one hand, you all have the knowledge of those stories. There's knowledge of those stories. But does the Qur'an repeat the stories? It does. The Qur'an is not a book of knowledge first. Because if it was a book of knowledge, it wouldn't repeat itself. In a book of knowledge, how many times do you have to give the information? 
Once. And if need be, say, refer back to page 30. You don't have to say it again. Allah says things over and over and over and over again. Another Western criticism of Qur'an, it's too repetitive. But Allah is calling the Qur'an what? Reminder. And the purpose of reminder is to tell you something you already know. And the thing that Allah reminds of us the most in the Qur'an is the thing we tend to forget the most. The things that are the hardest to internalize are the things that are mentioned the most in the Qur'an. Like the taqwa of Allah, the fear and consciousness and regard of Allah is mentioned over a couple of hundred times in the Qur'an. If that's a commandment, it just, just had to be mentioned once. But ittaqullah, 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 wattaqullah, fattaqullah. Right? Why so much taqwa? Because what is the thing we lose first? <laughs> it's taqwa. We forget. We don't, we're not in awe and regard and, and, and careful of what we need to do when we acknowledge Allah Azza wa Jalla's power. We're not careful. So we need to be reminded. This world is bombarding us all the time. You're driving down the neighborhood, you say, wow, that house is nice. I don't know why I bought the one that was 200 square feet less in size. And you go to somebody else's house and, and you remind, you know, you and your wife are appreciating the curtains they have and they match the, the couch so much better. So you're like, man, we need to get a new carpet. Did you see their backyard? Oh, that's a nice driveway. Look at this, I renovated our new game room. Right? You're obsessed with things in your house. You're obsessed with things about your car. This world bombards us. And what do you lose sight of when you're constantly thinking about this world? The next world. So what does Allah do all the time? He reminds you of the next world. Because you don't have to be told, worry about your dunya. Take care of it. You're not being materialistic enough. <laughs> Everybody's doing that enough. What are they not doing enough? Concerning themselves with the next, the next life, the next world. So it's repeated often. Anyhow, the stories in the Quran. Everybody knows the story of Adam alayhi salam? Now I'll give you, just, just as a matter of perspective, right? I'm going to present to you this story from the point of view of knowledge, and then from the point of view of guidance, just so you can see a comparison. We need the knowledge, but we also need the guidance, right? In this story, who's the ultimate bad guy? Shaitan, Iblis, is the bad guy. And he is being contrasted with which human being? Adam alayhi salam. Who are some other people or characters in this story? Is our mother? Hawa? Who else? The angels? Of course, Allah azza wa jal. Okay? We all know what happened. We all know what happened. I'm not going to tell you the story because you know the story. I'm going to tell you another story. Here's how it goes. There's a, you work at a company as an intern. You're like a junior in college and you get an internship. And this is about 35 years ago. You graduated, you got a full-time job at that company. After you got a full-time job at that company, a couple of years later you got into management. Then you got into regional management. Then like district management. Then like domestic management. Now you're international. And you kept moving up the corporate ladder. 35 years later you're the senior vice president of this company. You started where? intern, and now you're VP, okay, VP. You've got the biggest office all the way up on the top floor of the corporate building. The only one above you is who? The owner. the owner, the president. The president walks in with this high school kid one day. Okay, this kid's like looking around, chewing gum, right? Freshman in high school, kid. President walks in and says, um, yeah, this is our new senior VP and uh, you need to get him some coffee. And I need some photocopies made of these cheat codes for video games or something. <laughs> right? Now, you're watching all of this from a distance. You're watching this from the next office, over. That the president walked in with this unqualified candidate and is now replacing the candidate who was given his entire life for that job. What do you see next? Him? Who's he? Has he even graduated high school? Are you kidding me? You can't be serious. That can't be right. I've given my entire life to this company. You can't just replace me like that. And everybody else, by the way, everybody watching this scene, 
who do they tend to side with? I mean, if I was there, I'd side with the poor VP. And that doesn't sound fair. This guy, he did, he did a lot of work. Why should he not get the promotion? Why, why shouldn't he keep his job? How come he's being fired with this unqualified rookie? But I'm not telling you the story of some VP, am I? And if you think of it like this, it's kind of scary, because I don't want you to sympathize with shaitan. I don't. I don't. But I put it to you in this way because we think of stories in the Qur'an like these characters that didn't really exist. These are very real situations. This really happened. This really happened. And when shaitan presented his counter-argument, I want you to appreciate his frustration. And I want you to appreciate what he said. You know his argument, right? The argument was based on qualifications. The argument was based on qualifications. I'll give you another, before we come and wrap this up, I want to give you another part of this story. Here's my, my, my other story. Another employee in this company. He's, he's hired, he's doing okay, he's doing well. He hasn't done anything wrong or anything. There's a memo that was sent to the entire company that he's going to be transferred out of the company to some obscure location. New Mexico or something. Okay, he's about to be transferred. Everybody knows he's about to be transferred. The only one who doesn't know he's about to be transferred is him. And the boss comes to him and he says, hey, um, don't come late to work. He says, okay, fine, I won't come late to work. He doesn't come late ever. Comes in late one day. One day he comes in late. The boss says, I told you not to come in late to work. I'm sorry, you're being transferred to New Mexico. Okay? Now, was the plan already to send him to New Mexico? Yeah. Now, imagine this. Imagine this. He got a hold of the memo before he came in late that day. Okay? He came in, before he came in, one of the co-workers said, Hey, by the way, you're about to be sent to New Mexico. He says, What? That's depressing. So he doesn't, he, he's thinking about it, he's all sad. He takes a wrong turn, gets late to work. And he gets late to work, his boss says what? Or go to New Mexico. He says, wait a second, I'm not going to New Mexico because I came late. You had already made that decision. This is all entrapment. You set this trap for me. It's not my fault. You already knew this. Allah says to the angels, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً فِي الْجَنَّةِ خَلِيفَةً وَفِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةً when your Lord said to the angels, I am placing a Khalifa in the earth. This ayah and this incident, this, this quote, this declaration occurs before, before everything else. Before everything else. Now in Surah Al-A'raf, Iblis comes to Adam He says, by the way, what's about to happen? Basically, in between the lines, what we're being told in Surah Al-A'raf is, the offer of Iblis is, Either you will become angels if you eat from this tree, or you will become from what? Permanent residents. In between the lines, permanent residents where? Jannah. Why would he be interested in that? Because there's already an announcement made that Adam is going where? The earth. Now I'm sharing all of this with you, because Adam could turn around and say what? Allah already knew I was going to go where? The earth. As a punishment for eating the tree, by the way, where was Adam and our mother and Iblis sent? Where were they sent? Earth. He could say, Allah already knew. I'm sharing all of this with you for this reason. You have met people that say, if Allah already knows what I'm going to do, why is it my fault? The first person who could have asked that question is who? This is not a new question. The, p the possibility of asking that question existed then. Now I'm wrapping it up. Iblis could have had an intellectual reason. I shouldn't be demoted because he's made of clay. Intellectual reason. Adam salam could have presented an intellectual reason in his defense. Look at this comparison. Adam salam was given, was honored by Allah. Was Iblis ever honored by Allah too? Ever? Yes. Adam salam was given a rank above the angels. Was Iblis ever given this? 
Adam alayhi salam at one point disobeyed his Lord. Did Iblis also disobey his Lord? Sure. Adam alayhi salam had the ability to make choices. Did Iblis also have that ability? Sure. There's a lot in common. There's a lot in common. The thing that makes them different is not the mistake. But what happens after the mistake? On the one hand, there is one who believes that through their intellect, they can challenge Allah's decision and say, no, 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 I have good reason for disobeying you. I have a reason, he's made of clay. And on the other hand, no matter how much his intellect might even tell him, that I could say, I could argue in my defense that this is entrapment, what does he say? رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا We wronged ourselves. He gives up his intellect before the Lord of the worlds because he knows no matter how smart he thinks he is, who is the all-knowing? Allah. Who is the owner of all wisdom? Allah Azza wa Jal. So just because I can't wrap it in my head doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. It is beyond me. And I trust Allah. So he is forgiven and the others cursed. This story occurs in the Quran seven times. Seven times. If you read a juz a day, you'll run into it three, four days. Every three, four days you run into this story. You and I are being reminded not just, you'll say, I know the characters, I know what happened already. Let me move on to the next ayat. But wait, you and I are being reminded that both you and I, we make mistakes. We make mistakes. And what will make us different, what will make us like Adam, السلام, who was forgiven, is if we act like Adam, and if we act, don't, don't, like, like, don't act like Adam, we're acting like... At least you've got two options. We could justify our mistake. We could present rational explanations. Times have changed. I was in a difficult situation. You don't really understand what I'm going through. Blah, 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 blah. You could just go on and on and on giving rationalizations. Whose legacy are you following? Please. You're being reminded in a very powerful way. Take a seat back. Be like Adam alayhi salam. So it's not just a story. It is counsel. It's counsel. You know the story of Yusuf? Very famous. Everybody knows the story, right? Just again, just a simple example of how we take things for, for guidance. Allah Azza wa in Surah Yusuf, He tells us, Yusuf alayhi salam, obviously the good guy, who are the bad guys in the story? The brothers. And we think of a story like fictional. Good guys, bad guys, additional characters, plot, subplot, right? Introduction and body and conclusion. We think of it like a generic story. These are real people. People aren't bad or good. People do bad things and do good things. You know, they're, they're people. Umar radiallahu anhu is not a bad person. He did really bad stuff. And then he became Muslim. We don't make sweeping statements about people. But you know, when we oversimplify, and we think about it, okay, in the Quran, these brothers were bad, they were messed up. Did they eventually make tawbah though? Yeah, so they're not exactly the bad guys. And on top of this, I mean, you know, I think a lot about Surah Yusuf because when I travel, a lot of times I try to expose people of the problems our youth in the Muslim community are facing. Right? And I say, Muslims, our, our youth are really having a hard time. And one brother gets up and says, we came from a good Muslim family. Our kids don't do, do these things, brother. You're painting a very dark picture. After all, my great-grandfather was a sheikh. And my grandfather was a hafil. And then my father was a muhaddith, the you know, Ahmad family, or the Habib family, or the Sharful Islam family, or whatever. Our kids don't do these things. No, no, no. Whose kids are these? The brothers of Yusuf. Yaqub alayhi salam. And whose son is he? Ishaq alayhi salam. And Ishaq, whose son is he? Ibrahim salam. These guys are the sons, grandsons, and great grandsons of prophets. You don't get cleaner blood than that. And you can't argue that there was anything missing in their parenting either. You can't argue that. Is your bloodline going to save you? Coming from a noble lineage, coming from scholarly backgrounds, coming from you know, respectable families, does that save you? No. Stop kidding yourself. If it couldn't help those brothers, they had to be responsible for their own actions. And none of us are safe. Take the guidance from the story. Knowing the history is one thing, taking the guidance is another. We have to take the guidance. Right? We have to know the knowledge, and also we have to derive the guidance. They're profound lessons for life. So, personally relevant guidance is the first thing. Personally relevant guidance. 
I, mean, I always share this story. I never get tired of this story because it's my favorite story, so I'll tell it to you too. I think I might have told it to you before. It's about me and my daughter. You know, I have, alhamdulillah, I have four kids. And those of you that have more than one child, you know, your first child, everything's special. They so much as burp, and you say, where's the recorder? Right? But once you have two, three, and four, you say, what's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> it happens. So, and you're like, yeah, I was the fourth child. It happened to be quite <laughs> But you know, when I had my first daughter, Husna, I was obsessed, obsessed with this child. I'm praying at home, I'm praying Maghrib, I still remember. She's crawling around, and Allah gave us peripheral view. So when we make salah, we don't just see a rectangle in front of us. We kind of see this much too. So in the corner of my eye, I see her playing around. And for the first time in her life, she puts her hands on the ground, lift off, and she's standing up. And she's looking at me. I'm in Salah. So I do this. <laughs> in my Salah. It was amazing. I almost called for my wife. In the Salah. But then what happened was, I kept reciting. And I happened to be reciting Surah Al-Munafiqoon. And the next ayah I recited to myself was, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tulhikum amwalukum, wa la awladukum, an dhikrillahi, wa man yaf'al thalika, faulaika humul khasiroon. Those of you who believe, don't let your money, or your kids, take you away from the remembrance of Allah. And whoever does so, are the ultimate losers. Subhanallah. I forgot that I had a child. I forgot. Wallahi, I forgot. So I could know the tafsir of the ayah, I could study the context in which it was revealed, I could know it's a Madani surah or a Makki surah, I could have that knowledge. But when Allah throws that mountain on your head, that this is guidance, it's talking to you about your family, about your life, subhanAllah, that is therapeutic salat. And salat is therapy for you and me. That's what salat needs to become. That's why you and I are learning Arabic. Wallahi, that's why we're learning Arabic. If you're not, if you're not, like, if your goal isn't to just shed tears before Allah, then there's something wrong. Don't just do this as a casual thing. You know, we learn Qur'an, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّنَّ الْقُرْآنَ لِوَاتْ لِذِّكْرِ we've, we've facilitated the Qur'an for remembrance. For remembrance. So we have to keep that at the forefront. Appreciating the Qur'an, number one, as guidance. Quickly, number two, as a miracle of Allah. I should really have said as the miracle of Allah. The miracle of Allah. Just to help you appreciate this point, I mean, I tried to expose to you some parts of the miracles of the Qur'an in terms of its beauty. But the miracles really, they are endless. They're endless. But just to give you some idea of what I'm talking about, and, and the difference between our Iman and the Iman of the Sahaba because of this lack of knowledge. If I give you a, um, an offensive scenario, your neighbor comes to your house one day, out of the blue, Knocks on your door. You know this neighbor for 20 years. Knocks on your door. He says, um, Ahmed, um, last night an angel came to me. And he told me that I'm supposed to deliver a message on behalf of God. And since you're my neighbor, I figure I start with you. How do you respond? We as Muslims know there's no more messengers. But what if he comes to any other person and knocks on their door. Who's that Muslim? How would they respond? You're crazy. What did you have for dinner last night? Or you hold your cell phone behind your head and dial 911. And there's no possibility of your mind accepting that what this guy is saying is true. Everything else runs through your mind. He's crazy. He's playing a trick on me. He's got some ulterior motive. He's been possessed. He's being, you know, he's being mind controlled by someone else to do this. He can't possibly be saying that. But you know, a few thousand years ago, Allah had, before this chain of messengers had stopped, what did the messengers come and say to the people? When they say Allah is one, that's acceptable. When they say I am a messenger of God, an angel comes and speaks to me. I speak on behalf of the Lord of the worlds. Listen to me, unquestioned. Is that an easy thing to accept? No. 
First of all, it's not even an easy thing to say. Because if you're a smart human being, and the messengers والسلام, are the smartest human beings on the face of the earth, you know already, when I say these words, what the reaction is going to be. You already know. You already know. So they are putting themselves in the line of fire, in the line of humiliation, in the line of ridicule. Because Allah has commanded them to say something which we, it's easy for us to believe because there are millions of us. Billions of us, easy. But if you're the only guy, you're, his, you're the only guy who accepted him, what does everybody else call both of you? You're crazy. You're following that cult? The psychological torture that a messenger goes through when the people ridicule him on the one hand and he's calling on behalf of Allah on the other. We can never imagine. Our da'wah will never, will never feel the pain of the da'wah of a messenger. Never. It will never be the same comparison. And we will never feel the pain of the da'wah of the sahaba. You know why? Because they're the first ones. They're the ones who got, got called the craziest. They got called the craziest. Allah Azza wa Jal sent these messengers with this impossible task. And you know what? Not only is He asking you, you must listen to what I'm saying, believe first of all that I get revelation, which is hard enough. On top of that He's saying, by the way, everything I say is from who? It's from Allah. Therefore you have to obey it without questioning me a word of what I say. It has to be an absolute, unconditional following. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ have taqwa of Allah and obey me alone. Obey me, obey me, obey me. The messengers are being quoted over and over and over again. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ Have taqwa of Allah and obey me. Have taqwa of Allah and obey me. Taqwa of Allah is not enough. You gotta obey me too. That's hard. That's hard. You know it's easy to believe in God. That part is easy. What part is hard? The messenger. That part's hard. You can say, I love God. Yeah, there's a God. He's great. He's merciful. But when God picks one of us and sends his instructions to him, now God is actually telling me what to do, that part I can't accept. And then you just use the excuse, why didn't he tell me what to do directly? Why is he going through him? Right? In that impossible situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as an evidence to calm the people down that are saying, you're saying something outrageous, it's impossible. To calm them down, Allah sent, the, sent him a conclusive evidence that he is in fact a messenger. That once you appreciate it, then you will know this can't possibly human work. This can't possibly something from creation. It can only be from Allah, therefore I accept you as the messenger of Allah. This is the Qur'an. Allah gave this as the conclusive evidence of the truth in the claim of the Messenger The Qur'an is a proof for the Messenger and the Messenger's honesty and character is a proof for the Qur'an, it's vice versa, it's both, both ways. But the advantage Allah gave us before, over the nations before, you see Musa salam, people saw the, the water part. If you were skeptical before then, once you saw it part, you would say, okay, I'm I, I believe, I'm coming, you know. And now two generations later you tell your grandchildren, you know I saw the water part. Your children may or may not believe you. And then your grandchildren tell their grandchildren, you know my great grandfather saw the water part. Ah, uh, we've heard that story ten times. What happens in stunt Sunday school? You know, the she camel of Allah. You know, Isa alayhi salam, the blind person. And the kids are going, yeah, I know. The people who saw it, you couldn't shake their iman after that. Right? But the people who hear about it, they say, eh, yeah, okay. Nothing special. Allah blessed this ummah because the Qur'an was not a miracle for the eyes to see. The Qur'an is a miracle for what? The ears to hear, the eyes to read. So the miracle in its integrity as a miracle is retained one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. It's not just something passed down as I saw that amazing thing happen. The amazing thing's right here. It's still here. When I was explaining this to my sixth grade Islamic studies class, you know what they said? Oh, Brother Namah, it's not fair. I was like, what's not fair? And one of my students said, all these prophets got such cool stuff. 
We just got a book. <laughs> and you know what? As blasphemous as that sounds, he's on to something. I mean, it's a book sitting in the shelf. We're calling it the greatest miracle of all time. The Christian can turn around and say, hey, my book's a miracle too. The Bible's a miracle, right? Somebody else, the, the, the Hindu can pick up a copy of the Veda and say, this is a miracle. It's a philosophical miracle, right? The Buddhist can say that. So what makes our claim different? It is the knowledge and appreciation of the Qur'an as a miracle that made the Sahaba thoroughly convinced after every time they heard Qur'an recited, oh my goodness. Imagine, every few hours you get to stand in front of the water and watch it part. Could you imagine what kind of iman you would have? They're experiencing that miracle every time they stand in salat. They're experiencing something. There's a difference in that iman and our iman. There's a difference. Because they're appreciating it at two levels. Is the reminder, as that ultimate spiritual reminder, and at the same time as what else? A miracle. A miracle of Allah. It deserves to be appreciated in both lights. It is critical that we appreciate it in both lights. Because it has a direct impact on how convinced we are and how we live our lives. There's no, there's no inkling of doubt left. Like there's no inkling of doubt left. Now I want to share with you finally as a conclusion, inshaAllah ta'ala, what I want to share with you is, well, I agree. What am I supposed to do? That's great. The Qur'an is guidance. The Qur'an is a miracle. What about me? What do I do? You see, there are three kinds of people. And I'm taking this from a great work of tafsir, written by Amin Ahsan Islahi. You should read his introduction of the al Qur'an. Those of you who can read Urdu, those of you who can't read Urdu, uh, the first volume has been translated called Pondering Over the Qur'an. Uh, uh, Pondering Over the Qur'an. Uh, the translator I don't know, but the author is Amin Ahsan Islahi. Amin Ahsan Islahi. So he says there are three kinds of people. Once they acknowledge that the Qur'an is guidance, there are three kinds of believers. The first kind is the one who says, you know, Allah actually is giving me guidance in this book. And if I come across some, guide, some knowledge of this book that is guiding my life in a different direction, I'm going to change myself. I'm going to try to change my life according to the dictates of this guidance. Because you start reciting this Qur'an and learning it and memorizing it and studying it and you start realizing that this Qur'an is offering a lifestyle that's going this way and your lifestyle is going that way. So you've got to start changing some stuff. So the way you speak starts changing. The way you dress starts changing. The way you eat starts changing. The way the kinds of friends you have starts changing. The kind of job you have starts going through change. The kind of money you make starts changing. The interaction you have with your family starts changing. And when this change starts happening, the first people to notice are who? Your family. And your mother, your sister, your brother, your cousin. They come to you and you say, you're changing, man. Are you okay? I mean, we're all Muslim. You don't have to be that Muslim. <laughs> Which, you know, are you listening to these mullahs or something? Is that what's happening to you? Take the thing off your face. They'll come to the, the daughter. The father will come to the daughter. Why are you wearing that on your head? You're not going to go out like that, right? This is America. Don't do that. Who's going to marry you looking like that? They're going to take you away. Looking at your beard. They will say things like that. Your family. They're not going to say these things to you because they hate you, by the way. You know why they're saying those things? Because they love you. And they're scared for you. They think you're becoming crazy. And that's nothing new. Whenever people started turning to their faith, what did their families consider? Insanity as the only possibility. <laughs> and so what happens, especially the young people here, listen up. When you start turning a little bit religious, a little too religious than the rest of your family, or the parents start turning more religious than their kids, when that happens, then those that are not moving at your pace are waiting, patiently waiting, until you get a C on your test. Until one time you snap at your father. And then they'll turn around and say, is this what your Islam teaches you? It is that it's this, all this masjid stuff, that's why you got a C. That's why you failed. All you, you know, so they're waiting for your mistake. To blame what? The religion. And when this is going on, this psychological war that's going on in your home, you walk into your home and it's a war zone. 
It's a war zone. Your mother, your wife, your, hus you know, your husband, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your uncle, whoever they are, they are saying the most hurtful, sarcastic, poisonous things that if anybody else said, you would run them over with your car, but then you have to take it from them because they're your family, and eventually, young man, 18, 19, 20, you know, you're known to be hot-blooded anyway, so what do you do? You snap. You people are trying to make me follow the forefathers and the culture, and I'm trying to follow the sunnah, and you don't even have the right aqidah. Slam the door and walk out. It happens. It certainly doesn't. No, it didn't. <laughs> but I've seen it happen. And even if it did, I wouldn't tell you. So <laughs> But this happens. My family just doesn't understand. And now you start attending halaqat and classes and courses. Not because you want to attend classes and halaqat and courses, because you can't handle what's going on at home. And you just want to be away. Seriously, check yourself. Check yourself. You see, that is the biggest failure of our youth. You have to grow thicker skin. You have to grow thicker skin. You've got to be able to take it. Whatever they dish out, whatever they say, I wish you were never born. Is this why we brought you to America? <laughs> right? Whatever they say, it's okay. Smile. Be the best to your parents. Be the best to your parents. Whatever they're doing, they can't be worse off than the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam, who's manufacturing shit products for mass distribution. And he's kicking his son, who's right, out of the house. A lot of times youth tell me, oh man, my parents just don't get it, man. They don't understand. So what if they don't get it? That's not the point. The point is, if you're holding on to this guidance, then you got to have thick skin. There are people that came before us that were buried alive because they believed. You can't take some, some yelling from your parents. You can't take some sarcastic comments from your uncles every eve. Oh, we know what you were like last year. What happened this year, Malvi Sahib? Right? <laughs> They'll say that. Take it. People before us took a lot worse. Thank Allah we got it easy. Thank Allah these are not the times where believing is like holding coal. The Messenger warned us about that, right? Thank Allah that it's not like that. People think, people are always ungrateful. And we are ungrateful because we don't have sabr. Sabr and shukr go together. When you're not patient, you start complaining. And if the fact that you're complaining is a sign that you're not grateful. Allah is giving you these opportunities to grow your personality, to become forbearing. And you know, I give you advice, when you take guidance seriously, especially young man and young woman, and you're having trouble at home, do more at home. Skip the class. Vacuum the house. Get your mom some flowers. Massage her feet. You know, prepare the taxes for your father. Do something. So instead of associating rebellion with Islam, what do your parents associate with Islam? Service. Better character, better behavior. Don't, don't, don't do it the other way around. So anyway, the first people that turn on you are the people who love you the most. And that's the hardest thing to deal with. It could be from your spouse, it could be from your children, it could be from your parents, it could be from anywhere. But it's a hard thing to deal with, because they're always there. You always have to deal with them, and you have to keep your best relations with them, right? Then the next step, after that, you start losing your friends. It gets even worse. What happens is, you know, before you turn to the religion, you go out with your friends, watch a movie, you know, go do some hookah or something. A lot of guys do that in New York, right? Or, you know, uh, go hang out, worse. But after you turn to the deen, you don't want to waste your time. So you don't hang out as much. And when you don't hang out as much, they're not your friends anymore. So on the one hand, your family's turned on you, on the other hand, you lost your friends. And on the third side, you realize your income is haram, so now you lost your money too. So it seems like when you turn towards this guidance, everything that was a source of joy in your life has now turned into a source of pain. From every direction. And this is the ultimate psychological test. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you can hold out this test and ride this difficulty, then Allah gifts you with the ultimate gift. You know what that is? That is real iman. That is an appreciation for guidance because you paid something for it with your pain. And it is after you pass through this test that something changes inside your personality. Now, after this change, after this test, you find calmness in your prayer. You don't say, oh man, I just prayed, I gotta do it again. 
You don't do like that anymore. Now you seek the prayer. Instead of the prayer having to come knock on your door, you're knocking doors on the prayer. It's the other way around, because there's something changed in your personality. You are inclined towards obedience to Allah. You don't find it a burden anymore. And then Allah starts opening these doors that you couldn't even imagine. He starts opening these doors. He starts introducing you to people. You start replacing old friends with much, 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 much better friends. And he does this all because you decided that you want to take the guidance seriously. Taking the guidance seriously is not a joke. You go through a lot of hard times. Be mentally prepared for it. Hasiban nas an yutraku. Hasiban nas an yutraku an yakulu amanna wa hum la yuftanu. People think that they're gonna just say that they believe and they're gonna be they're not gonna be put to test. No 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 no. Wa la qad fatanna aladina min qablihim. We thoroughly tested the people before them. We did. None of us is going to be free from this test. This is the first kind of people who go through these tests and pass. And this is the minority of people we ask Allah to make us from them. The second kind of people who say, yes, Quran is guidance. Yes, it's a miracle. Yes, it's saying the right thing. I just can't do it, man. I don't know how you do it. You get people that come to you and say, hey, you pray five times? Yeah? That's awesome, man. Every day? On time? I could never do that. That's so awesome that you do that. I wish I could do that. Make dua for me. That Allah gives me tawfiq. Right? So now, have you ever heard this by the way? I can't do it? I don't know how you do it, that's so awesome. Right? Allah blessed you especially, He didn't bless me especially. By the way, the prayer, which is the bare minimum, the, in the, on the practical life of a Muslim, the bare minimum is the prayer is the equivalent of like the law, like breaking the law is criminal, right? This is the law of Islam, so not praying is criminal behavior. You don't go to someone and say, hey man, you, you stop at every red light? Every one of them? <laughs> every day? Oh man, I could never do it. You don't think like that, because you acknowledge that that's the law. And you just don't break the law. And if you do, you're criminal, right? But our mentality about the prayer has changed. Anyhow, the people who say that they don't have the ability to do so, don't even realize that they are uttering a blasphemy. They're saying something blasphemous against Allah Himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says multiple times in His book, La يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا Allah does not burden any person. Allah does not place a burden upon any person. إِلَّا مَا أَتَاهَا إِلَّا وَسْعَاهَا إِنْ بَقَرَةً Except by its capacity, that person's capacity. Meaning, in other words, practically, if Allah put a burden on me, the only possibility is Allah knew already that I am capable of carrying that burden. Otherwise, Allah says He would never put a burden on someone who is not able to carry it. So if Allah put the burden of the prayer, put the burden of avoiding the haram, put the burden of fulfilling the fara'id, put the burden of these things on me, that by definition means that I am capable. There is no extra capability that I don't have that somebody else has which is keeping me. Allah made me inherently capable. It is only my excuses. So either you're telling the truth when you say I can't, or Allah is telling the truth when He says you can. You're accusing Allah Azza wa of something you shouldn't. You understand? So that's the second kind of person. And then there's finally, there's the third kind of person. The first kind of person who commits to change. The second kind of person, the excuse maker. The third kind of person who claims to commit to change. Who talks a lot about the change. But actually, doesn't change. And to compensate for not changing, what he or she does is, he or she becomes extremely outspoken. And that's all there, all that noise is there to compensate for what's missing in action. Okay? You know the leader of the Munafiqun, La'anahullah, Abdullah ibn Ubayy, before the Prophet would get up for khutbah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would get up before him. Oh people, this is the Messenger of Allah. We should listen to him carefully. Thanks, but we already knew that. He's not saying that because that's an important message. He needs the mic time. He needs to show everyone that he is committed. 
And he has to say it in such emphatic terms. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ When the hypocrites come to you, they say, we bear witness. You are so definitely, truly, you're really the messenger of Allah. When you say something like that, then what are you hiding? You're not really sure he's the messenger of Allah. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَا رَسُولُ Allah knows you're his messenger, by the way. Allah also knows, Allah testifies they're lying. They don't, they don't mean it when they say it. So the hypocrite, what he does is he hides. He hides his lack of change with words. Just words, empty words. And I'm not saying this so you think, yeah, I can think of two people in this community that fit that, yeah. And before I forget, I should probably write their names down. No, that's not why I'm saying it. Because the, the, the problem of hypocrisy the thing about it in our deen is, hypocrisy is a measure not for you to judge anyone but yourself. The only time you should be thinking about hypocrisy is never for anyone else, always for yourself. For anyone who says, La ilaha illallah, we have this fail-safe, this mechanism, this security system called khusnul dhan. We make the best assumption about the other. We make the best assumption about the other. Benefit of the doubt under all circumstances. Under all circumstances. But for yourself, only you know. Allah's, Allah's Messenger tells us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَا أَمِنَهُ إِلَّا مُنَافِقْ وَمَا خَافَهُ إِلَّا مُؤْمِنْ The only one afraid of hypocrisy is a believer. And the only one who, the, only hip, the hypocrite is the one who is, feels safe from it. They're not afraid of it. We have to be afraid of hypocrisy. We have to be afraid that our words are just words and they're not translating into change. That's a real fear. That's the fear of the Sahaba. They didn't walk around claiming that they're true believers. Umar radiallahu anhu is nervous that he's a munafiq. He's nervous to death that he's a munafiq. Umar radiallahu anhu. How can we be safe? We can't. So this final thing, I, I, I leave you with this inshaAllah ta'ala, that this hypocritical attitude it's manifested itself in different ways. One of the ways it's manifested itself is, let's compromise the teachings of Islam, let's pre present a watered down version of Islam, and present ourselves as the champions of the enlightened, reformed Islam, right? And we are so courageous because we're standing up for this deformed version of Islam. And we're the actual torch bearers, we're the, we're the champions of this religion. So what you're actually doing is compromising this deen, but what you're presenting yourselves as is what? Heroes of it. And another great hypocritical scam that's, that's infested this ummah, first you start by saying, I believe the Qur'an, but these scholars, they were ultra-orthodox, narrow-minded. We need to have a broader vision. So first you knock on the scholars. When you're done with the scholars, you say, some of these Sahaba, I don't know, they're not messengers, right? We don't have to follow them. Then you take the next step and you say, well, these Sahaba, they're the ones who transmitted hadith. So we, sh we shouldn't really trust the hadith, we can only trust what? The Qur'an. The Qur'an. And you're not really saying we should follow the Qur'an because the Qur'an is authentic, everything else is inauthentic. The real agenda is because the Qur'an has injunctions that are given precise shape and form in the Sunnah, right? The Qur'an has general injunctions that are given their precise form in the Sunnah, like the prayer. Prayer is an outline piece by piece in the Qur'an, it is outlined in the Sunnah, right? But you don't want to pray. What's the easiest thing you could do? You could say, you people don't even, you don't have the open mind enough. You're following hadith? Oh my God, you people are backwards. We just follow Qur'an. What that, what that is, is one of the ultimate scams of hypocrisy. It's a scam. It's all it is. It has no intellectual foundation. It takes a second grader to, to, to convince someone who says the hadith can be trusted, Qur'an can be trusted. If you say one of them can't be trusted, you're saying none of it can be trusted. By the way, the people who transmitted the Qur'an are the same people who transmitted the hadith. And if you say they can't be trusted with hadith, then automatically they can be trusted with Qur'an? No, 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 no. Either you believe or you don't believe. Pick your sides. 
It's that simple. It's really that simple. So I wanted to conclude with this in, in our class just to give you some perspective. I pray that Allah enhances you in your knowledge of Tajweed. I, I pray that He enhances you in your memorization of Qur'an. I pray that He enhances you in your knowledge of Qur'an. I pray He enhances you in your love of the Qur'an, in khushu'a, in your prayers, and that He inspires our children, all of our children, all of our families, all of our elders, with the love of reciting this book, of implementing this book, of learning from this book, of doing dhikr from this book, and to have a relationship with this book, much like the relationship the companions of the Messenger, radiallahu anhu ajma'in wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they used to have. If we can have that, inshaAllah ta'ala, there will be a different, this, this will be a different community. This will be a different community. May Allah Azza wa forgive our shortcomings, and especially mine, because I run my mouth a lot. And I tend to say obnoxious things, and if I offended any of you, I'm truly sorry. I really am very, very honored at the opportunity to have, to, to just have the opportunity to serve you in this community. And I, I pray that you really enjoyed yourself. I certainly did. I really did. And I've been looking forward to teaching in Houston for a long time, so this is actually a dua come true for me. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, you know, the last thing I want to say to all of you is, if uh, you can, at the end of this month, I haven't, we haven't confirmed it, we're trying to, we haven't confirmed it. At the end of this month, I'll, I'll try and send one of my colleagues, Hafiz with